All right, so welcome to Math 150, Section 2, Lecture 12, 2021, multi Calculus. I think that's all the information I'm supposed to say. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do directional derivatives. And we've seen a lot of this before. So to some extent, you know, directional derivatives is clearly something that's not going to happen in one dimension. Because in one dimension, you really only have one way to move. So when you start to look different direction, that's really a multivariable calculus problem. We have seen directional derivatives already. Uh, they have moved the chairs, unfortunately, and because of pandemic restrictions, I do not know if I'm legally allowed to touch the chair and move it around for you. You can move, you can move the chair, but for me to touch a chair that I'm not sitting in, that could violate some campus policy. We will now be posting just section one today after saying that. All right, so where have you seen directional derivatives? In multi calculus. They've had a different name. We've seen them, we just didn't call them directional derivatives. We saw them with partial derivatives. Um, directional derivatives. So, you know, dx dx, let's assume we have a function just of two variables for simplicity. It's the limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h y minus f of x y divided by h. So this is the partial derivative of f in the direction of the x axis. We could, of course, similarly define it in the direction of the y axis. I can write this in more vector notation as the limit as h goes to zero as, as the point xy plus h times i hat, the unit vector in the direction of the x axis, minus f of xy, the identical vector, divided by h. So we've seen directional derivatives before in special directions. And now the idea is, can we find the direction of the road of an arbitrary direction, preferably in terms of these standard points? Notationally, we can write that as dx, we sub x of f evaluated in our point. And so maybe instead of using the point x, y, maybe I'll use the vector h. And I'm going to do this as point a. And it's often you know, good to use a different letter for the point so we can distinguish between what are the variables and what are the points. Now, I'm taking the derivative with respect to x and evaluating it in x. It's often convenient to do that, but it's sometimes nice for the formula to just write it like this. Another notation that's often used is f sub x at a. And so this means the partial derivative of f with respect to x. So as soon as we do this, this suggests you might want to take multiple partial derivatives. What does f sub x y mean? Good. So this means first take the derivative with respect to x, and then take the derivative of that with respect to y. Or partial of f sub x with respect to y. Could you have defined it to be the other way, where first we differentiate with respect to y and then with respect to x? That's the answer the question that was asked. Oh, no. Could we have defined it the other way? Oh, yeah. Yes! We have the freedom to define things how we want. It would probably be a bad idea to use a different notation than everyone else in the world. Uh, who are my econ people? Okay. What am I missing on this plot? Labels. Okay, and so what are the labels? Uh, one of these and which way? Which is the x-axis? Uh, the x-axis is quantity. X-axis is quantity. And the y-axis? Right. right. Could I put quantity up here and place down there? Absolutely. It would then be the opposite notation of every other economics 
paper and textbook and would cause confusion, <coughs> you can define whatever you want. Do you mean like, um, like how X, Y, and No, no, what, I, what I'm saying is you can define this to mean first you differentiate it with respect to Y and then with respect to X. What we're doing here is we say we first differentiate with respect to the variable that's the subscript that's closest to X and then we leave out. That would be terrible. Why? Oh, like you the other one? <laughs> it's just, it's perfectly valid to do it either way. However, if you could have your choice, what would you love to be true about these two expressions? Okay. That they're equal. If they're equal, then it does not matter which way you do it. Right? And so, if the partials exist and are continuous, then they're equal. So in a situation like that, we're in great shape. And then we don't have to worry about which order we take the derivatives. So frequently, we will be fortunate and we'll be looking at problems where the partial derivatives exist and are continuous you know, so that these derivatives are the same. More generally, you can look at D sub B of F at the point A. And this should be the limit as h goes to zero of f of a plus h b <laughs> minus f of a divided by h. So this is the definition of how you calculate the directional derivative. And this is one of my favorite notations, one of my favorite names. It tells you I'm taking the derivative of the function f in the direction of b at the point A. Everything is there in the notation, so when you look down, you see what it's describing. Now, just because we can define something this way does not mean that this is how we would actually want to do the calculation in real life. It's like when we take derivatives of functions, we don't go back to the definition of the derivative, we use scalar. And so using the chain rule, we show that this is the same as the gradient of f at the point A, dotted with B. All right, this is nice. The gradient of F is something we can compute easily. That's just the vector of partials. So what kind of quantity is this number? The gradient of vector A dotted with B. Is it a number? Is it a vector? Is it a matrix? Is it a tensor? Okay. Wait, do we have a split decision? So the vector, what did you say? So we have a vector and a number. So we have a dot product of two quantities. Is um, this? So it's a number. And whenever you have the dot product, this is going to be a number. So the directional derivative is actually giving you just a number. It's not giving you a vector, which is what the gradient of f is. Which direction do you think the directional derivative is largest at? So if I had to choose the direction V, what direction would this be largest at? The direction of? Mm -hmm. Sure. I want to calculate what direction is F changing the fastest. So I want to see where is the directional derivative largest. Now, one thing you have to be careful about is I can make the directional derivative larger just by rescaling V. If I multiply V by five, so V now has five times the length. I've now just increased this by a factor of five. So I can make the directional derivative, if it's not zero, as large as I want by just choosing a bigger and bigger vector. What might you assume about V? Often, we, what, would you, what should we assume about the vector V? It's a unit vector. And so if we assume that V is a unit vector, and I can't play these stupid games of making the directional derivative larger just by taking bigger and bigger vector in the same direction. I should be talking about if I go a unit vector in a direction, how is my function changing in that direction? So this is a really good constraint to put on. We're not going to really do much with your equations of objects moving, but you're in physics, they often do this. 
and there are formulas when you're going through curves in space, and they have parts that depend on how quickly you're tracing the curves. And it's often convenient to assume you're walking at unit speed, because then you don't have to worry about certain factors that involve the speed. It's the same thing here. It's often much more convenient to just assume that the vector v has unit length. So this quantity is the length of the gradient of f at a times the length of v, which is just one, times the cosine of the angle. So that's one of our laws from earlier. So how can we make this quantity as large as possible? What direction should I choose for v? The direction of f. So largest if v in the direction of you said of, of what of what of f. F is not does not have a direction. F is a number. It's not the direction of a. A is the point we're evaluating at. There's only one other quantity in play. The gradient of f. So it's large if it's in the direction of the gradient of f at a. That's where it's going to be largest. Because then the cosine of the angle is going to be one. Where will it be smallest? Where would it be smallest? Opposite. So the direction of negative green of f at a is where it would be smallest. So if you think about what's going on, if we're choosing a vector, think of it as we're moving in a line, and we've now reduced it to a one-dimensional problem. That's what we did in the video online with the chain rule. You were traveling in a line. So what must be true to have a maximum in one variable? If I have a differentiable function and I want to have a maximum, what must be true? So what's true to have a maximum of a function of one variable? How do you find candidates for maximum minimum? Derivative equals zero. We're at a critical point, or or you're at the end. So if we're at an interior candidate for maximum or minimum, then the directional derivative must be zero in every direction. So you know, at a maximum in the interior, all directional derivatives. Zero. Yes. So is this like if you took a cross section of like a function and then just found the width of like at, at, like along that? So I mean, if, if my function looks something like this, then you see it's going to be maximum. And then if I you know stay on the surface, no matter what direction I go, it's perpendicular to the gradient of that. Yeah, I didn't mean um but Direction. So the direction of derivative is telling you how much you're changing in that direction. So view it as you know, we're walking in a straight line, here's the point A, and you just go infinitesimally in either direction. And that's the direction of derivative will tell me how much I'm changing as I walk along that line. I could do instead of a line, I could do you know, any kind of curve that comes in here and has the same tangent at that point. It's a little bit easier to think of it as a line rather than a more general curve. But if I'm instantaneously going in this direction, how much change do I see? And if I want to be at a maximum or minimum, then any direction I move, I can't be larger. If the direction of derivative is positive, well, move in that direction and your function will get bigger. If it's negative, move in the opposite direction and your function will get bigger. And so the only chance we have for maximum or minimum is that the directional derivative has to be zero in every direction unless you're at the boundary and that's what tomorrow's lecture is going to be on which law of course equals five right so any questions on the directional derivative so 
when we look at the direction of primitive, we have the definition, which is coming from you're just generalizing partial derivatives. And the only thing that changes is rather than saying we have to move along the axes, we can move in other straight lines. You need three pieces of input whenever you're doing a directional derivative. To compute a directional derivative, you need the following. So the first is you need the function f, and more generally, its derivative or its gradient of f at some point a. So I probably should say that first you need the point a and you need the direction v. I have to give you all of these ingredients. If I give them to you, then the directional derivative of f at v in the direction of a is just the gradient of f at a dotted with v. So once you calculate the gradient of f, you can apply this to lots of different directions. And you just can take the dot product after dot product after dot product. This is a great way to compute it. It's defined through a limit. So on an exam, I could ask you to find directional derivative. Now, if I ask you to define, then you would give the formula involving the limit. I could ask you to state a formula to compute the directional derivative. You could state the limit formula as this is how I want to compute the directional derivative. But if you do that, you're making your life needlessly complicated for yourself. You want to avoid taking limits. This is the formula you want to use to compute things. We know how to take the vector of partial derivatives. We know how to take the standard derivative of f. We know how to do dot plot. This is a really good formula. OK. So that is basically all the directional derivatives. Any other questions on directional derivatives? OK. So in the first section, they asked to talk about one of the extra credit problems, which involves one of the strangest functions you will ever see in mathematics. It is a function that should not exist in some sense, but it does. And it shows you why well, pure mathematicians have jobs, because they have to figure out ways to handle something like this. What's nice is this is an opportunity to talk about some of the material that we'll see later in the semester, Taylor series. So depending on what school you went to, you may have seen some things on Taylor series. It is not a requirement for this course. Now, you have seen Taylor series in the past, we just haven't used the phrase Taylor series. And the idea is to replace a complicated function with a polynomial. And the more terms you have in the polynomial, hopefully the better it does. So you have the function f of x. The zero for what a Taylor series is just f of zero. So you basically say, I know where I am at time zero, and I declare that for all eternity, that's where I am. If the only information I give you is your value at zero, you can't do better than this. Because I don't know, am I increasing, am I decreasing? So my best guess is to say there's no change. Imagine, however, I will give you one additional piece of information. What would you like to know? The derivative at what point? And then we use that to do the first order to get zero, which would be f of zero plus f prime of zero times f. So we start off at f of zero. That's my instantaneous speed at zero. That's my elapsed time. And what we're basically saying is that I assume my speed is constant for all eternity. And that's how we will approximate this. If you could have another piece of information, what would be next on the additional? The second derivative. So you would then get t2 of f, the second order Taylor series extension is f of zero plus f prime of zero times x plus f double prime of zero over two factorial x squared. And the two factorial needs some justification. Let's look at what's going on. When we take x equals zero, 
All of these terms start off with f of zero. And because we have x is here, all of this vanish. So all three polynomials agree with f of x when x equals zero. Let's check and see what are their derivatives of zero. Well, if I take the derivative, you have f of zero, that's a constant, so it's derivative of zero. If I take the derivative of x squared, if I take the derivative of one, I get two x, and x equals zero, that's still going to be zero. So this piece doesn't contribute to the first derivative at zero. And so both of these will just become f prime of zero. So they agree with the function f of x at zero, and they agree with f prime at zero. If I take the second derivative, well, these two terms are going to vanish because I've taken two derivatives, they go away. And the x squared is going to become 2x, then 2 times 1, which is 2 factorial, cancels the 2 factorial, f double prime of 0. Oh, okay, it agrees. What do you think the third order Taylor series is? Going to be? It should start off the same f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial x squared. And what would you guess is the next term? So we have a pattern. What would we guess is the next term? F triple prime at zero. Yeah. And when you take zero, one, and two derivatives, the x is cubed is not going to go all the way down. It's still going to have at least one power of x. So it will vanish from x equals zero. But if I take three derivatives, three comes down as a three factorial, and I get f triple prime of zero. So in general, we can say the Taylor series of f is just going to be the sum and goes from zero to infinity, the nth derivative at zero over n factorial times x to the Again, this is going to prepare us for later in the semester when we really talk about Taylor series. Now, whenever I write something like this down, you have lots of questions. The first question is, does the series converge? The next question is, if it converges, does it at least converge to the original function? And if the answer is yes, for what values of x does it converge? So I'm going to give you now one of the worst functions in all of mathematics. It is e to the negative 1 of x squared if x is not 0, and 0 if x is 0. This is a very strange function. We'll, we'll plot it in a little bit, but essentially, the plot looks something like this. If you think about it, if you take x equals 1 over 100, then 1 over 1 over 100 becomes 100, so that 1 over 1 over 100 squared becomes 100 squared. So you get e to the negative 100 squared. So its value at point zero 0.01 is e to the negative 10,000. If I take, instead of 1 over 100, if I take 1 over 1,000, I get e to the negative billion. And it gets worse as I take smaller and smaller x. This function crashes down to zero. And it turns out that when you calculate the derivatives of this function at zero, every derivative of this function is zero. So the Taylor series is identically zero. And what this is saying is that at time zero, I'm at zero, my speed is zero, my acceleration is zero, my acceleration of acceleration is zero, and so on and so on and so on. Every derivative is zero, and yet, as Galileo once remarked, it moves. It does not stay at zero, even though every derivative is zero at zero. This is a strange function. One of the reasons I want to talk about this is it's a great way to review some material in calculus. I always like to review material from calculus while showing you something good. And so you should not be impressed that the Taylor series of that function agrees with the original function at zero because I forced that to happen. You know, look, every term in the Taylor series starts off with an f of zero plus things that are being multiplied by x. Well, if you multiply it by x and x equals zero, what would that give you? Zero. So I forced it to agree with f at zero. Yes. I would have thought that f 
differentiable at zero. Ah, so good. So now we need to prove that it's differential. It has a split definition. So because it has a split definition, if I want to differentiate it, I can't just say, let me just take the derivative of each piece. How do I find the derivative of this function at zero? What would I do? It's the opposite of the advice I just gave you in calculating direction of derivatives. Yeah, take the limit. You have to go back to the limit. So I really like doing this after giving you a warning that we don't want to go back to the definition of the derivative. We want to prove formulas to calculate derivatives nicely. If I have a split definition, I have no choice. I have to go back to the limit of h goes to zero, f of zero plus h minus f of zero over h. And so this is the limit as h goes to zero of e to the negative one over h squared over h. Okay, this is zero over zero. When you see zero over zero in a limit, what do you think of? Let's evaluate this limit. Okay, so what's the, what's the phrase? Lopitalit. So you know you've made it when your name becomes a verb. Okay. The Lopitalit. In fact, I believe the L'Hopital's formula was actually not proven by L'Hopital, but was proven by one of the Bernoulli brothers, who was tutoring L'Hopital in mathematics. And part of the deal was L'Hopital, who's paying for this gift to put his name on it. So if the limit um, as x goes to a of f of x over g of x is zero to zero or infinity to infinity, this equals the limit as x goes to a of f prime of x over g prime of x. And what if you still have zero over zero infinity over infinity? What do you do? You do it again. And you keep doing it until eventually you don't have zero over zero or infinity over infinity. Now, if I try to locally tell this, when I take the derivative of h, I get one. But when I take the derivative of this, I get e to the negative one over h squared times the derivative of this. Oh dear Lord, this is gonna give me like a one over h cubed. The degree of the denominator is getting larger. So when I do what we tell things get worse. So the solution is, you know, to be a little bit clever with the output. I can write it as one over h e to the one over h squared. And now I have, as h goes to zero, I have infinity over infinity. I can actually prove directly that this limit is zero. One way to prove it directly is e to the x is one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus the like up. So that means e to the one over h squared is one plus one over h plus one over two factorial one over h squared plus dot dot dot. So as h goes to zero, one over h goes to infinity. This is going to infinity much faster. I can drop all the other terms and I make the denominator smaller. So if I just focus on the quadratic term, I made the denominator smaller. If I make the denominator smaller, what happens to the fraction? It gets bigger. As I have one over h divided by one over h squared, oh, perfect, that's one over h, it's gonna to go to zero. Or I could look at it. And before I look at it, I'm gonna let a, is one over h, so if h goes to zero, what does k go to? So if k is one over h, if h goes to zero, what does k go to? Infinity. And this way, I'm going to just have a little bit better things to differentiate rather than having a one over h and either the one over h. This is now the same as the limit as k goes to infinity of k over e to the k squared. And that's a much easier thing for me to visualize. What's the derivative of k with respect to k? One. And then e to the k squared is going to become 2k e to the k squared. So that's just here. 
So if you go through and you do the algebra, you get the limit is zero. And with a little bit more work, you can show every derivative is sadly zero at zero. If the function is not identically zero. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to just you know show a little bit of how to look at this with mathematics. Okay. So there is my function. So f of x, the underscore means this is a variable. And I have a split definition. If the absolute value of x is not zero, it's e to the negative one over x squared. And if not, it's zero. So I can define it very nicely. And then I am plotting my function x goes from negative one over c to one over c. And I'm using this beautiful command called manipulate. This is, a, this is a situation where it is okay to manipulate this. What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to zoom in and zoom out. And so here, I'm letting C range from one to 10. And so right now the value of C is one. I can move C up to 2.07. And look at how quickly it's dropping. It goes from negative, oh, so it goes from 0.004 to very rapidly, you know, it's hard to distinguish it from zero. Let me zoom in a little bit more. So here's, 3.88, and you see around negative 0.2, it's at six times 10 to the negative 10, and it's falling fast. Let me zoom in a little bit more. Here's 6.58, we've got 10 to the negative 27. You're here at you know, 9.15, it's 10 to the negative 52. All right. That is quite small. It's at less than, 10 to the negative 53 by negative 0.05. This function is decaying rapidly. Now I could of course go in the other direction and I could take C equals 0.2. So that's the same as plotting uh, up to minus five to five. And you're getting a sense of what the function looks like. As X gets very, very, very large, what does E to the negative one over X squared go to? Well, as X goes to infinity, what does one over x squared go to? So the x goes to infinity, what does one over x squared go to? Zero. So I'm basically looking at e to the zero, which is just one. And you can see, oh yeah, it does look like it's converging to one. Uh, you know, I could you know, go out a little bit further and you can see you know, it's really looking a lot like it's converging to one. And so you're going to plot like that. You know, this is where you're looking at the labels on the y-axis is very nice. It's 0.99997 going all the way up to one. Okay, so for the last bit of class today, what I want to do is I want to review a little bit of trigonometry and talk a little bit about how you might find ways to prove things. So one of the hardest things is coming up with the steps to do to prove things. And so here are two, or actually three trig identities. You know, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. And then the angle addition form is cosine of A plus B is cosine A cosine B minus sine A sine B. And sine A plus B is sine A cosine B plus cosine B sine A. So the first identity we've seen before, this is just Pythagoras. And it's a Pythagoras with a triangle with hypotenuse one and angle A. So there's my cosine A, there's my sine of A. The other one is new. I will prove it in general in a few moments. It turns out that for the application I want today, which is formulas for pi, we only need the special case of A equals B equals X over two. And the idea is, and I'll make these slides available. The idea is if you know the cosine and the sine at the angle X, can you figure it out for the angle X over two? If so, you can then figure out any angle or get arbitrarily close to any angle, but in some sense, you know, like a binary approximation by doing inclusion exclusion. Yes. So, so, yes. So uh, wait. that's if A and B are the same. So it's sine A cosine B. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yes, you're right. This, is, this one can be simplified. Yes, you're absolutely correct. 
it's, it, it is the same as two sine and cosine. Yes. I'm just writing it like this because in terms of how we actually do the proof, it's going to come up like this, but you're absolutely correct that to compute, you would do the simplification. So we want to calculate the sine and cosine of x halves, given that we know the sine and cosine of x. So there's a couple of angles where you are happy if I ask you, what's the sine of the cosine of this angle? So we'll call these happy angles. Anybody want to give me a happy angle? Zero. So zero and 90 would be happy angles. What's another angle that we know the sine of the cosine or should know the sine of the cosine? 45. 45. From the 45, 45, 90 triangle, the 1, 1, root 2. Or if you want the hypotenuse to be 1, the 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 1. There's one other pair of angles that would be happy. 30, 60. From the 30, 60, 90 triangle, coming from the equilateral triangle, 60, 60, 60. So if we can find formulas for the half angles in terms of the full angles, from 30, we can get 15. From 45, we can get 22.5. And so if I wanted something like 18, I would start off maybe at 30, go down to 15, that's too low. So maybe then have to add up a little bit. You can start playing games like this. So we need the special case of B equals A equals X over two. And so if I plug that in over here, this is the formula I want to prove. Cosine of X is cosine X halves, cosine X halves minus sine X halves, sine X halves, and something similar for sine. Okay, so I want to express the cosine and the sine of X halves in terms of the cosine and the sine of X. And so again, I can simplify and I will now do the suggestion that I shouldn't just keep writing this as cosine A, cosine B, cosine B, cosine C, and just note that it's twice. And so, I want to try to find a way to isolate for cosine of x halves in terms of cosine x and sine of x, and sine of x halves in terms of cosine x and sine of x. I still have this identity. One equals cosine a squared plus sine of a squared. I can choose any value of a. I claim that there are two good choices of a, given that we want to understand the angle of x halves in terms of the angles x. Anybody have a suggestion of what would be a good value of a to substitute into this formula? A equals x over 2. So that is one of the two good guesses. There's one other guess. One guess is x over 2, and the other guess is x. It turns out x over 2 is the one that is going to work well. So if we take a equals x over 2, and we plug into cosine squared a plus sine squared a, we get cosine x hat squared plus sine x hat squared equals 1. And we suggestively write this underneath cosine x hat squared minus sine of x hat squared equals cosine of x. What should we do to those two equations? Yeah, give it a sense. How do we do that? Yeah, if you add them, you get cosine x plus 1 equals 2 cosine x hat squared. Now what do we do? So how would we do this? What's the next step? We want to solve for cosine x hat. So what should we do? We just divide by two, and then we take the square root. And so you get cosine of x halves is the square root of cosine x plus one over two. Does that vaguely resonate with something you might have done in trigonometry years ago? This is one of the identities you should have seen in trigonometry. You can derive it from the you know, angle addition formula. If I do the similar work, we can get a formula for the sine of x halves in terms of the sine of x and the cosine of x. So if we know cosine and sine of x, we know cosine and sine of x over 2. Why should this make us happy? Well, let's try to calculate areas and perimeters of circles. So if we're going to do that, if we're going to use these formulas, we need to prove that these formulas work. So I'm going to assume a and b and a plus b are all less than 90 degrees. And what kind of triangles do we like? Right triangles. So basically, all geometry proofs come down to drawing auxiliary lines. And we basically want to put in as many lines as we can to get right angles. So I can draw a red line down here and make a right triangle here. I can draw a blue line and make a triangle there. I can also drop a green one and make another right triangle. And what's great about that is, ah, this green triangle has an A plus B as an angle. 
So I want to calculate the cosine of a plus b, it's right there. Now, we'll still need more right triangles. This is not nearly enough right triangles, but it's a start. And again, the goal right now is to just talk to you about how you think mathematically, how you get some of these proofs. We have done this before, but you know, now we're doing it in multicolor. All right, so let's look at what's going on. If I want to look at the cosine of a plus b, that's just the base of the green triangle. If I look at what's going on, the blue triangle, if that's one, then this blue height over here is going to be the sine of b, and the length over here is going to be the cosine of b. So when I look at this triangle over here, the hypotenuse is cosine of b, the angle is a, so the x extension is going to be hypotenuse times the cosine of a, so it's cosine b cosine a. And so this whole length over here is cosine b cosine a. Over here, this is cosine of a plus b. So we just need to figure out what this length is over here and subtract, and now we'll have the cosine of a plus b. If you look, um, you know, I wanted this length over here. I've also drawn that length up over here because it gives me yet another right triangle. Yes? Um, how would you get that, the cosine b times cosine So if you look at this big, woo, if you look at this big red triangle, I start off with the initial blue triangle and the adjacent side is just gonna be cosine of b. So if I look at this red triangle, but I only go up to here, the hypotenuse is now cosine of b, the angle is a, so the adjacent side satisfies adjacent divided by hypotenuse is cosine of the angle. So cosine of a is adjacent over cosine of b, so the adjacent is cosine of b times cosine of a. Thank you. Yep. And so now we want to chase down angles. So if this angle is A down here, this is 90, this is C over here, or 90 minus A. But you know, given that I want you to be able to read it, I'm just using C rather than 90 minus A. Now we use that we have you know, two lines intersecting like this. So this angle over here is going to be the same as this angle here. If you want, if this is C, this is 180 minus C, so this would have to be C over here. Since this is 90, this has to be 90 minus C, also known as A. Since this is 90 over here, and this is A, that has to be C. So now when I come up to this triangle over here, two green sides and a blue, it's 90 here, it's C here. So what does the angle have to be up here? It has to be A. And so now when I look at this triangle, it's got a hypotenuse of sine of B. I have an angle A over here. So this is going to be cosine of A times sine of B, and this would be sine of A sine of B. And now I can just use that to get the cosine of a plus b by subtracting this part and get the sine of a plus b by just going through this. So it's again, just a careful collection of results. All right, so let's apply this. So sadly, Pi Day fell on the weekend and also fell in the midst of a pandemic when we're not really supposed to be taking our masks. So hopefully later in the semester, we can have a party and celebrate Pi Day. Let's try to calculate the perimeter of a circle. So what is the perimeter of a circle of, radi of radius one? Perimeter of a circle of radius one is two pi. two pi. So we're going to take inscribed and circumscribed polygons, regular polygons, and we're going to let the number of sides grow. And the hope is that the more sides you have, the better approximation you should get. So we're going to start off with a square. And I'll mostly work with the inscribed, the circumscribed is similar. If I go from a square, if I bisect every side, what do I get? Well, no, what, what kind of figure? Octagon. So I go from the four-sided square to the eight-sided octagon. After the eight-sided figure, what comes next? How many sides? 16. Does anybody know the name of the 16 bond? It could be, I, I'm pretty sure there is some name using Greek and Latin words. And then this, after the 16 would come the 32. And you can see visually that the more sides I have, the better fit this should be for the perimeter. Well, let's take the square. The radius is one, so this side has to be root two. So the perimeter of the inscribed square is four square roots of two, 5.6 roughly. Two pi is about 6.28. It's not terrible. If you round them to one digit, they at least agree to one digit. All right, so let's see how the octagon does. So for the octagon, well, if we draw through here, this is a 45 degrees. And this length over here is just root two over two. So now what we want to do 
is you want to cut this in half and have not 45 degrees, but 45 over 2. And if you want to find the perimeter, I would want to find the length of this whole blue side and multiply by 8. Or if I find the length of just half of the blue side and multiply by 8, I would get half the perimeter. What is half the perimeter of a circle of radius 1? Pi. Given that you have pi in your mind much better than you have 2 pi, and you have hopefully digits of pi that you can rattle off, let's look at half the perimeter rather than the full perimeter. So we want to calculate the sine of 45 over 2 to get what this length would be here, because we have a hypotenuse of 1, an angle of 45 over 2. So this length here is just the sine of 45 over 2. So we first calculate the cosine of 45 over 2, and then we use that for the formula for the sine. And so we get the sine of 45 over 2 is 1 over 2 squared, so 1 plus 1 over root 2. So when the dust settles, we get 4 over square root of 1 plus 1 over root 2, about 3.06. How is that for an approximation of pi? So, yeah. so let's do a few more. 16, 32, 64. You get 3.12, 3.136, 3.14. All right, so by the time we get to 64, we're already getting two decimal places. And we have a really nice formula. And what I love about this is we have an explicit answer involving just integers and square roots. Now, the question is, can you look at these formulas and try to guess what comes next? Do you notice any patterns? <laughs> and that's one of the hardest things in math is to try to identify patterns. And that's the real reason I want to talk about this. What pattern do you see? Do you see any way to go from one level to the next? There's lots of different things you can focus on. So what do you notice that's the same from one level to the next? If you add another term, you add another term. So it looks like the denominator is the same as before, and you add one more term. And how do you get that new term? It's what? Two plus the square root of another term. Two plus the square root of whatever the longest term was before. The two stays the same in the numerator. And what happens to the number outside the square root? It doubles. Can you notice any relationship between those numbers and the number of sides? It's just half the number of sides. And in fact, if we were going for the perimeter, not half the perimeter, it would be equal to the number of sides. Do all of these four expressions look the same, or does one look a little different? Yeah. So how many people have seen Sesame Street where they have the little routine, one of these things is not like the other, one of these things just doesn't belong. And they give you like a baseball bat, a baseball glove, a base, and a dinosaur, and you have to decide which one looks different. And when you're really young, this is a challenging game. You get very excited. It's the dinosaur, Dad, it's the dinosaur, right? Over here, the first one looks very different. Do you think the first one is different, or do you think it's just written differently? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's written differently. So given that we know what the answer should be, can we do some algebra to make this work out? And so I'm not going to go through all the algebra in detail. I'll send you the slides. You can you know, always just hit pause on the video as well. And then just if you multiply by one in, in the right way, when the dust settles, you can get it to equal what you would want. And so everything will come out nice. And so you can rewrite things. If you wanted to go to the next level to 128, you get to 3.14128. Can anybody give me a couple of digits of pi? It's 3.14, 15, nine. So it's not so bad. So we're getting three decimal digits, but you can see that as we keep increasing the number of sides, you know, the number of digits we're getting is not growing that rapidly. So this formula works, but it's not a fast approach. And that's an interesting question as to, are there better formulas to calculate pi and there are? All right, this is a good place to stop.